Hello and good morning, everyone. Yeah, we are excited to tell you more about our cloud native journey. So it's fantastic to be in this lovely city, Amsterdam. And after this very inspiring lightning talks, Alessio and I are looking forward for an amazing day to share you our experience and cloud native journey we did so far at Swisscom. So I'm Josh Hiller. Um, I'm a product owner at Swisscom and I'm very passionate about DevOps and bringing together people and ideas to build innovative solutions. And with me is... Yep. Diamante Alessio, Senior DevOps Engineer at Swisscom. My first time at KubeCon, but I hope I will be able to give you some technical details on how we try to move up from a spreadsheet to everything as code. So let's get it started. So yeah, back to the title. So first we want to explain, oh no, what's that? Oh no, my teammate put me on the on the on-call service for our 5G core. So now Dev, uh, Ops Jenny is calling me. So I will take the call. <laughs> Sorry, I, I missed it. So yeah. Alessia will explain you more about yes. the what's going on. Actually, what's going on here is that someone by mistake probably deleted uh, CC CCRC, which is our um, NRF function. Uh, I don't, cannot here maybe, yes. As you can see here, there is a CCRC namespaces that was created uh, la lately, in three in three minutes, which means that it was been uh, deleted and now it's back alive. This was on our uh, on-premise infrastructure, and now if I manage to find my mouse, yes, you will see that it's exactly the same situation here for DNRF in AWS cluster we have. So we have a freshly created namespaces. Uh, thanks to our automation, we don't have to worry about that and we can continue with our talk and we will see at the end what's the result. So back to you, Josh. Yeah, so why we are doing this? So first, we really want to improve our time to market to build new services for our customer. And as well, we want to benefit of to benefit of cloud elasticity so we can build our telco workload on different clouds, on public cloud, private cloud. With this, we also want to increase or improve our innovation to build more reliable services that we can operate our services at scale. But all this new te technology is, is arriving and we need the skills really to be able to manage and build this automation. <laughs> ah. Sorry. So for this we have our journey from telco to techco and there we have four pillars. So one is really about simplicity. So we so Telco infrastructure or services are increasing in complexity, so we really need to be able to simplify to be able to build new services or products uh, fast and get them out to our customer. Then the next pillar is cloud nativeness. So it's not about religion, it's really about sustainable uh, operational benefits we want to achieve with the elasticity of cloud. And for this, we also really need the automation. And there, yeah, we cannot use any more spreadsheet. We need to have everything as code, so we have it described in our repository and we can push it to the different infrastructure. And to do this, we also need to change how we work. So it's not enough to be able that someone just knows about a certain capability and the next person knows about the next capability. So we really need to work together to be able to make this automation work. So how we do this? So first, we have one backlog for the whole 5G core we built at Swisscom. 
and there it really helps to prioritize and as well to to share the knowledge between all the different teams and we really encourage the people to work on tasks of other teams and share their knowledge so really a boundaryless collaboration as well we really take together networking engineers uh, kubernetes experts and application specialists to build this new 5g 4g core together and we 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 start to to experiment way faster so we test something we fail and then yeah we we try it an, uh, with another solution so we really try to rapidly find new solution for the problems we are facing and the last point is really we have a close collaboration with our vendor so there we can give them fast feedback and push them in in the right direction to build more cloud native workloads with this i want now to go more into the technical detail so to make all this work and be able to spend more time building new products or services for our customer we really need to have the end-to-end -end automation so we don't need to spend our time on tedious uh, repetitive work anymore so to give us give you a short introduction on our automation pipeline so first there is an overarching pipeline today we use Jenkins for that and then we have a few sub pipelines triggering different functionalities so we get the package from the software packages from our vendor to our software gateway from there we use the sourcing pipeline to check this and monitor if there is any new software take it if needed decompose it push it to our art um, artifactory all the artifacts the helm charts and the, the images and then we also do security scan so we get alarms if there is any vulnerability in the software we, we receive from our vendors in the end and then the most important thing our devops team which manage everything as code in our git repository so our full service is fully described in the git nowhere else and then we have our different clouds we have a public cloud private cloud and there we have our kubernetes cluster and we use a, an operator called flux to go to git read the description what to deploy then go to the artifactory to get the helm charts the image repo and then synchronize this to the kubernetes cluster and with this then we fully automatically can deploy our 5g 4g core then if a cnf is deployed it will notify the the, the overarching pipeline and will trigger some post deployment step or then also the configuration the business logic of the, the cnf also this ansible is fetching this configuration from git and then pushing this over netconf to the different cnfs in the end and as well then we have additional pipelines to trigger an element manager or to configure an element manager a security manager to to know about the new cnf which was deployed to be able to communicate with it and get the information needed for their capabilities and then really one of the most important part is our testing pipeline there we have different tools we can trigger and there like for example chaos testing which was um, mentioned before from litmus so there we we can trigger this after a upgrade um, after a config change as well we do this continuously testing we will show you later and do this to different cnfs or as a system under test or as an end-to-end -end test so and there also very important is our observability capability where we get all the metrics the logs we have as well a dedicated cost, uh, cluster for the long-term storage uh, where we store all our data and this cluster is as well managed by the whole pipeline 
and then we use our internal uh, monitoring as a service to create the dashboards to, and as well to create the alarms. Unfortunately, we were not able to hear it before, but that would be Obstini calling me yeah, that the uh, namespace of the post NRFs got deleted. With this, I would like ha to hand over to Alessio. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for the great introduction. I would like now to go to some more technical details about the Git repositories we have and how we manage them. The first one I would like to talk about is the IP low level design repository, which is one of the milestone change we lately introduced. It's uh, an Ansible inventory where we store all the IP-related information for all the application, infrastructure, and all the tools we use to manage our 5G core. It's really uh, what enabled us to uh, further automate everything else. So as you can see in the left side, we have um, um, the Ansible inventory with us, which are the Kubernetes clusters we manage that are divided in groups, uh, different groups, regarding their characteristics. On the right side, instead, you can see an example of how uh, we store the parameters. So it's a plain YAML file with a hierarchical structure, and it's, as you can imagine, far away from what we were used in the past with spreadsheets, where you have a spreadsheet in somewhere in SharePoint with a freestyle structure. Everyone can go there, modify it, now, if, this one, if the, uh, these parameters are stored in Git, you have a centralized way, you have a peer uh, review process to introduce changes, and it's the only and unique place from where you get parameters. The way you can get them is described at the bottom of the slide, so if you are within an Ansible playbook or a Jinja template, it's natively supported with a path and the name of the parameter you look for, and it's as well quite easy for a generic script, like for example, Python or whatever, you can use the Ansible inventory um, command piped into a JQ parser and use the path and the variable name to get the value you look for. This is uh, what we do not only for the IP related parameters, but for all the parameters of application and infrastructure we manage, as I will show later in the next slides. Um, let me now go into some more details about the code base for our uh, CNFs. Uh, as you can see from the top right corner, uh, we have uh, actually at that moment one repository for each CNF we manage. It, this was not the case at the beginning when, when we had an all-in-one repository. However, this is not manageable at all. You can imagine the amount of PRs that are coming for introducing different changes in the different uh, network functions. It was not scalable and manageable at all. So we decided to come to a, a splitted version for each CNF. The structure of each repo is anyway the same one and is the one that is depicted in this slide. So as you see, the first folder we have is the Ansible folder where we store uh, the application low-level design. So all the parameters that belongs to the application which are not IP related. It's again another Ansible inventory where in this case OS are the different instances of, one of the CNF we manage. In the example, you have CCPC, so the policy control function, and you see all the hosts, uh, that all the different uh, instances we have. We store parameters, as I said before, per host, so uh, we, which are specific of um, uh, a specific CNF instance, or uh, in group wars, well, when they are shared across different um, CNF instances. In the same folder, we have uh, sorry, we have as well uh, uh, Ansible playbooks and Jinja templates we use to produce the configuration and um, Kubernetes uh, deployment files. So there is Ansible playbooks that fetches values from the different low-level design parameters and populates templates to produce the application files, which are again stored in Git with the structure you can see in the slide. So for example here, uh, sorry, for example, here we have uh, 
all the files for the day zero, which are the Kubernetes resources and the uh, day one configuration files, which are the files that Josh sh showed you before are pushed via netconf. Uh, for what concerns the branching strategy uh, we have in place, we have one branch for each cluster we manage in the different sites. So uh, several branches for each cluster in dev staging and production. How merging strategy works is depicted in this slide. So the idea is that when we want to introduce a change or whatever, an upgrade or, or a new feature, we start clean from a feature branch and we produce all the files from templates for all the different um, clusters. So when all these changes are ready, we raise a merge request to move from the feature branch to one of the development um, uh, branches, to, so to one of the uh, dev clusters. We perform some tests, which are uh, automated, and when uh, the uh, feature is validated to be working as intended, we move then from one, the first dev cluster to the other dev clusters. Again, when moving from dev to staging, the same process, a lot of testing, when it's validated from one stage cluster spread across all the other stage clusters, and finally, eventually, hopefully, to the production. What is really important here is that the, with the template, we really gain a lot of uh, velocity and uh, we reduce the failure rate because the structure of the thing you introduce, the change of whatever it is, is always the, the same and parameters are gathered from uh, the low-level design inventories. Going now to the infrastructure repo, we have here, uh, we managed, as we said before, two kinds of infrastructures. So the, we have the on-premise one, which is uh, the one uh, that um, the, which is uh, deployed through the package we get from our vendor, Ericsson Cloud Container Distribution, ECCD, which is a flavor of Kubernetes deployed on top of OpenStack VMs. Uh, here in this uh, case, we have as well Ansible um, uh, inventory, so we store parameters for ECCD in a specific repo, and again, Jinja template and playbooks to produce deployment files, environmental fi file you may be uh, familiar with for OpenStack, that is then deployed via a pipeline. For the uh, AWS um, case, we store as well in Git all the parameters for the flow engine um, step functions that we use to deploy all the uh, needed resources in uh, uh, AWS, so EKS, uh, VPCs, and whatever we need. Going now uh, to another repo, uh, which, which is the one we called common repo. This is another uh, milestone, let's say, repo, which is kind of glue among all the other repositories, because here we store some common artifacts, like, for example, the Jenkins pipeline we use to trigger the day one configuration via netconf. We store as well a bunch of playbook, Ansible playbooks uh, that are used to configure uh, the, um, some other systems, like for, for example, the gateways, the routing, and the firewall rules we need to operate our 5G core. There is as well the definition of the flux operator, which as, uh, is the operator as just showed at, be at the beginning, we use to um, deploy our Kubernetes uh, apps. Uh, just a quick detail, on, uh, a quick info on how we manage the rest of applications, which are different applications, kind of like for the one that we use for testing or for our ob observability stack. All of those are uh, as well, of course, stored in, in Git and they are managed as well the same way as the others. So inventories, flux, and uh, eventually some Ansible playbooks and pipelines. But how all of this comes to, together and glue to uh, have what Josh introduced at the beginning? This is what I tried to depict in this picture. So the idea is that at the beginning there is a manual input and introduction of the parameters in the different low-level design repos. At the moment it's manual, but it could be as well automated like for example via an IPAM. When all, the, all those parameters are ready, the uh, automation kicks in, like for example, for the infrastructure, we have a playbook that is pulling in, uh, info, 
information, populating template, producing configuration files, and then again with another pipe, pipeline, it's the uh, infrastructure is deployed. When the infrastructure is ready, we have other playbooks that, uh, again, pull the information from the, all, the, all the application and IP low-level design, populate template, and produce configuration files. Day zero files, which are um, in our language, let's say, uh, Kubernetes files, and day one files, so uh, netconf configuration files. Flux now can take those files from the Git and deploys them on our cluster, as well as for uh, some bunch of uh, tools, like for example, the external secret operator we use to sync secrets from the ASHICorp vault. Now, then there is the day one pipeline, which configures via netconf, and when the CNF is ready, a bunch of testing cases are executed. To complete the picture, uh, we have as well some other small repo we manage, like for example, the one where we uh, define alerting rules, uh, which uh, is uh, one, one of those others is the one that we received at the beginning of this presentation, alarming us that a namespace was deleted. And lastly, this repo here on the upper left side where we have all the other tools we deployed, as I said, with Flux. After all of that, uh, our automation, I hope, should uh, have worked as expected. And let me now go to um, see in the dashboard if everything is back as intended. So we prepared this dashboard here for the KubeCon. Uh, then my VP, okay, the VPN, I hope it's working back again. Uh, yes, so actually what you can see from here, this is the Grafana dashboard. So for the uh, with the metric that we get from the cluster, we see that there was a period where the, of course we lost a lo lot of pods because the namespace was deleted and now the situation is more or less back to normal. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the NF back uh, registered, but yeah, this is real life. Sometimes it takes time to get all the NF registered back into the NRF. Uh, what I would like to show you as well is that uh, I think that we have problems with the VPN, but the idea was to show you here some logs entry about, uh, yeah, it's even worse now. Anyway, this should, we should have been some logs entry about the changes we made. Uh, so the netconf um, configuration that were pushed and as well some information about the testing uh, let me see if I can recover this situation. Probably, ah, it's reconnecting, I don't know why. Uh, really sorry about that. That should have, okay, yeah, uh, anyway. Let me maybe try quickly, but nah, I will not make it. Really sorry, but yeah. And with that, Let's switch back to the presentation for some conclusion from Josh. Yeah, so really important there was also that we really are able then also to show the, the test progress. So you would have seen how many test, tests were successfully completed after this redeployment. So we don't need to touch anything to get the CNF back or to deploy a new CNF. So that can now be fully automated. And with this is really that basically our conclusion is that automation outruns spreadsheet. So we will not work with text file or something stored on an individual laptop. That's not anymore possible in such an environment. And we really can benefit of cloud elasticity, especially if the workload supports it, that you can deploy it wherever you need it. It's important to have this low-level design as code and the smart repository structure. And yeah, you need to bring together the, the good engineer from all domains to build really the, yeah, to figure out the best solution for the problems you need to solve, which really is able to then transform with the technology. So for us, we have started the 
our journey from telco to techco. And yeah, with that, thank you for listening to us. So if there is still time for a question or we can move to the next talk. Um, I was uh, checking about the possibility to ask the questions. The audio setup doesn't allow that. That's why I'm going to uh, uh, play this role. Um, thanks for this presentation. Uh, very insightful. Uh, I am quite curious, um, how do you tie this in, uh, the, for example, the, the uh, change process with the merge request promoting from environment to environment into your existing well-established change management process uh, in the company? So that has not been done yet. So there we, we we try really to go new ways. We are working with our change management to see how we automate changes and which, which changes really need to go through this change process and what's just done automatically. Because yeah, there, with, with how we work now, it's not possible anymore that someone understands why this change is now going to production and even yeah, have the time to click somewhere to accept it or even ask someone why this now needs to go to production. We really want to get to a change capability where we bring like 20, 100 changes a week or even a day to production. So it gets impossible to know exactly what which change is really doing. And there we also think that because we, we have this structure and all the testing that we are very confident that everything which gets push, pushed to production is not breaking something. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh, and thanks, Alessio. Uh, next on the stage, please give them a round of applause.